Thank you. Try the mic. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Um, thanks, everyone. So yeah, I'm going to talk about uh, taming spaghetti infrastructure. Um, just so on the book, I'm working on the third edition of the book um, right now. Um, and so the talk is some of the kind of ideas and things that are going into there. Some of what I'm thinking about that, that that's going into this edition. Um, uh, early thoughts. So you know, feedback is is, is really appreciated. Um, I'm also very conscious um, that uh, we're going to be hearing in a minute, or af after me, we're going to be hearing from Adam about what he and his team are doing to make the, the stuff in my, my book obsolete. Um, <laughs> but I think the, the, there's different you know, kind of, I don't know, layers of abstraction or what have you with this stuff. And the stuff that I'm talking about, I think, is, is, re is really around kind of how we design and put together infrastructure as it kind of grows and we have lots of people working on it. And I think the, the improvements that uh, you know, we, you know, we're in the midst of seeing and that we should be seeing over, over the next number of years are around kind of taking away some of those lower level you know, annoyances and, and, and things and so that we can focus on the higher level stuff. But one of the things that I've kind of realized as I look back on how um, stuff has evolved o over, the past, you know, over the past really is that a lot of the, the, the challenges that we face are, are kind of still there, and it's in terms of how do we think about how to design you know, and put this stuff together. Um, so I suspect in some form or another, a lot of this stuff will still be relevant. Hopefully we can focus more of our attention on, on that, on the kind of really you know, the meaty stuff um, rather than details. Um, so one thing that I often get faced with as I, as I, as I work with clients, I should have mentioned also that I, I work with ThoughtWorks, which is, a, which is a consultancy, so I spend a lot of time working with different clients, especially kind of larger, uh, you know, I don't know, banks and media companies and so on. Um, and that's where it gets really messy, right? Which is where it gets fun. Um, but some of the, the things that I often hear from, especially if you're talking to kind of more senior leadership and all that, is like infrastructure is, seems just like, it, it's, it's kind of like just like plumbing or whatever. And when I, and when I, when I say we need to think about the, our strategy for how we kind of architect the infrastructure to make sure that it can really support, um, you know, the organization's goals, whatever we're trying to do. Uh, sometimes I get told, well, you know, we're, we're, that's the solved problem, right? We've signed the deal with, you know, AWS or whoever, and that's, you know, job done. And it's like, well, not really. Um, so, uh, you know, I'm sure most of you are familiar with um, Corey Quinn's stuff, and he wrote that piece a little while back on 17 ways. There's 17 different ways to run a container on AWS, followed up with another one and another one. <laughs> um, and some of them are pretty obscure, like weird uh, edge cases of, of, of uh, yeah, okay, there's a container in there and all that. But I mean, the point is, like as a, as a, as a platform, like the cloud, the clouds to me are not really a platform. They are kind of just like a collection of stuff that you can assemble and use in, in various ways, right? And then when you kind of combine, you know, with all the kind of the, the, the cloud native computing foundation, that whole list of all the kind of tools and things like that. Um, <laughs> yeah, we need to, you know, obviously we need to do a bit more than just say, here you go, right? Have at it. Um, so I would say that cloud is the start of our strategy for infrastructure, right? And so the most recent State of the DevOps report um, that came out had a, a, a little piece on, on cloud. We had an interesting thing where they were talking about how um, it doesn't automatically produce benefits, adopting the cloud, right? And in fact, they've seen that oftentimes organizations as they move to the cloud become less effective in those ways that they measure, you know, the, the measures of effectiveness that they have. Um, Unless they make use of flexible infrastructure, unfortunately, the report doesn't really go into much details of what does flexible infrastructure mean, right? So I kind of like take the opportunity to say, well, it's, it's the stuff that I think you ought to be doing, right? If, I, if you do stuff the way that I, I think you ought to do it, then that's, that's flexible and hopefully it, hopefully it does help you to be more effective, right? Um, so one of the things that I'm expanding on in the third edition of the book is around environments because I realize it's one of these things that, it's one of those terms that like we, we talk about um, and we think we're talking about the same thing, but maybe we have kind of different definitions and so on. And so it's useful, I think, to kind of hone in on it a little bit and think about, um, you know, how we, you know, how we define it and how we kind of um, design um, environments, right? So one basic way of defining it is just to think about it as it's where you have like multiple workloads that are that are related, right? That are that are somehow having to integrate together um, and, and probably share some elements of of the infrastructure. Right, and so obviously defining the environment as code is kind of what we do with our, our infrastructure as code, right? So 
The challenges we get is when we start scaling it. By scaling it, I don't necessarily mean the load and that kind of thing, although that's a thing as well. It's more about the, the numbers of things that we're running on it, the numbers of applications, of services, uh, you know, business capabilities, the number of people working with it, the number of people you know, building different aspects of it and parts of it. You know, again, as these, you know, for a large organization, we're getting kind of really, uh, you know, it gets really messy, right? And so there's three kind of areas of challenges that I'll talk a little bit about. One is uh, supporting the software delivery, right? It's the classic, you know, we need to kind of test our software through environments um, and getting that into production. Also, the, the number of environments, by which I mean particularly the number of like production environments where maybe you're running in different geographical locations or you're like replicating, maybe you have software that you have multiple customers, maybe it's, um, uh, you know, multi-tenancy or those kind of things. So maybe you have to have multiple environments for, you know, for those kind of reasons. Um, and also the number of workloads, the number of different applications and things that you're running on top of your infrastructure. And so all of that kind of adds complexity, right? It makes it harder to manage. So the, for the first one of those, effective software delivery. Um, multiple environments here is about the classic path to production. Whatever kind of environments you have, you're going to progress your software from one to the other. Now, it's interesting. So back in, in the old days when we started out with infrastructure as code, uh, we talked about configuration drift, and back then, configuration drift, we were talking about the differences between environments um, that, you know, you have your software that works and, and you deploy it to the staging environment, it works there, it passes its tests, and then you start to deploy it to the production environment and it doesn't run because there's some little difference in some library that's installed on that server versus the other server. And so this was the problem we were trying to solve with that, right, and the idea that you're going to have this infrastructure code that you're going to run across all of your environments and it's going to kind of... Um, you know, deal with that configuration drift and keep things consistent, make it easy to kind of have, you know, this was also the time when DevOps and continuous delivery were, were kind of new concepts, this idea that we're going to kind of make everything really smooth across the board. And so this was really kind of a key thing. What I'm kind of, it's disappointing to see that a lot of times what we, what we end up doing is essentially doing snowflakes. You know, we used to talk about snowflake servers. We often do the same thing now with code where it's like for every environment we have a different copy of our code and uh, you know, we make changes by like, you know, we make a change to the code for the test environment, we apply it there, we say that's cool, um, and then we copy the code to the staging environment, and we edit it to, you know, to make sure it's like, because there's some differences between the environments and then the same thing for prod. And so we've kind of go away from this. And um, it's funny that the, the term configuration drift these days tends to focus on the, each environment, like the, the code for the environment does it match. And we worry about kind of getting drift that way, which is, okay, yeah, you do want to have your code and your, 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 your actual stuff uh, match, but it's like it's really across, across the board is where it, gets, um, where it gets messy. And so a useful pattern to, to, to think about and maybe go back to a bit is how do we make sure we can reuse our infrastructure code across the environments, right, and use things where there, are, where there is a need for, for variation between the environments. We can use kind of configuration parameters and all that, but we kind of codify it. It's all in the code rather than in the head. Make sure you remember when you copy the code from one environment to the next to, to tweak this or that. Um, yeah, taking the same code and, and, and bringing it across environments. Another kind of common thing that we, we do is where you have the infrastructure team is having to kind of build stuff essentially by hand, kind of, kind of on demand, um, you know, for whoever is running stuff. So application team says, oh, we need to kind of have to make a change to our configuration for some of our infrastructure, for our database or message queues or what have you. And so they have to raise and ask the infrastructure team, can you go and do this for me, please? And then they go and edit the code and, and, and make the changes for us. Um, something that I think is interesting that, that start, starting to see a little bit more of is this kind of more dynamic type of environments where stuff gets provisioned automatically, uh, maybe when the, the software is deployed. And this is kind of, I think it's building on the, the kind of GitOps idea of, okay, you have your code and you have, you know, for each environment, you have the, 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 the um, version of the code that's meant to be what's running in that environment, what's applying to that environment. Um, and that's getting kind of extended into infrastructure with things like, um, you know, cross-plane and stuff, uh, you know, things like that, where they have like the kind of controller pattern. And I think there's a lot of kind of, I guess there's a, there's a lot of kind of questionable stuff here or things that, that, that people get a little uncomfortable with. One is the fact that the, these kind of patterns that I'm talking about tend to be implemented a lot in this kind of the cloud native as code for Kubernetes, right? You have to have Kubernetes in order to do this. And maybe I don't want to run a Kubernetes cluster just to, my manage, my, just to manage my infrastructure. 
Um, and then also, uh, in, and, and so also then the idea that you, you need to have it, it uh, running kind of behind the scenes, right? So you push the code change and then something happens and then your, your environment is broken and then you have to kind of scratch your head and figure out how. So I think there's, like there's challenges with the way some of this stuff is implemented, but I think the concept is quite cool in the, in the, the separation of like, as someone who owns an application, I don't necessarily want to think about um, you know, having to write the, the, the low-level details of infrastructure code for my infrastructure. I kind of just want to say, look, I need a database, right? And maybe I have a few um, things that I, that I need from that database. I'm going to be storing personally identifiable information in there. So therefore, I need whatever the right things to happen should happen with that in terms of encryption and policies and so on. Um, but as an application developer, there's that, that level of what I care about and what I would like to have just kind of happen. And so if you kind of build this stuff um, well, you can kind of empower those application teams to say, I can kind of create a new environment, right? Because I'm just saying, deploy my application and, and you know, we, we know the kind of infrastructure that it needs and that can just be done. Um, so we can kind of have those kind of separation of concerns um, between those. Another challenge I see quite a lot is where, uh, so the environments are, are kind of static. And again, even though they're, they're, they're built with infrastructure as code, you kind of have this idea that creating a new environment is a lot of work, right? So if we say we want to have like a performance test environment to do some special testing, we got to ask the infrastructure team and, and you know, it, it takes time to get set up. Um, and then it kind of sits there and maybe kind of runs up costs as it, as it uh, you know, as it keeps, keeps running. And then what this kind of leads to is where you have um, like lots of different teams, like different application teams deploying their stuff into the same environment and trying to test it there. And there's two kind of, um, I guess negative outcomes I tend to see with this. One is that um, the, the environment becomes a blocker. It's like, oh, we, need, we have a change we want to test. We want to deploy our application, but another team is, is testing stuff in there, and so we have to wait for them, and it becomes bottlenecked. Um, or it's like, oh, that's fine. Everybody just deploy your stuff in there and don't worry about it. And then so you deploy your application, uh, something breaks, and you try to figure out what did I do to break it, and you realize, oh, it wasn't me that broke it. Somebody else deployed something in there and made a configuration change or what have you. And so there's this kind of this thing of like, we're, we're kind of like fighting over these environments. And I think that has a lot to do with it, again, being this kind of static uh, thing that's a little bit hard to set up. Um, and so it's an obstacle, right? And so it becomes kind of, kind of a precious resource. And then you also get this, the kind of uh, ironic, I guess, um, thing that you, you also get is that you get environments that are underutilized, right? So you get this clash of everybody trying to use these environments, but you also get environments that are sitting there racking up costs. Um, and the reason being, of course, because it's hard to get an environment set up. Once you get one set up, you, you don't give it back, right? You can hang on to it. Um, and so I think this, this, this inflexibility and this kind of, um, uh, you know, the static nature of the way we manage environments, even with code, tends to lead to this. And so I think if we get into this kind of thing where we can kind of dynamically provision environments and provision them according to what's being deployed on there and as, as kind of a, uh, uh, you know, an automated kind of thing, you can start doing things where you have like just enough environment, right? Um, and so your full production environment might have a whole bunch of infrastructure, you know, some different infrastructure for three different applications, but then you're going to deploy um, just the, oops, wrong way. You're going to, you, you have just that one application that you want to test some changes to. Um, you can say, let's, let's deploy just enough of the infrastructure for that application to run. Um, and maybe mock out and stub anything in, in terms of other applications so that we can do that, right? And so that kind of gives you the ability to kind of manage just what you need and ideally do it um, on demand and, and, and you know, deprovision it automatically when it's not, you know, not needed anymore and so on. And so it can be just done more efficiently. And so then if we think about, so that was the, you know, the, the software delivery stuff, you know, how do we support that with our environment? So, as we think about having more environments for production, there's, there's different reasons we might have that, right? When I, I mentioned, you might have different regional customers uh, that you need to kind of have, uh, and you know, in some cases you might you know, try to have a single environment that, that meets all of them, but in a lot of times, due to regulatory things and all of that, you end up needing to have separate kind of copies of your systems and separate copies of your infrastructure for each of those. You may also have SaaS customers, right? You may, depending on your business model, it may be that you have customers that come to you and so you're going to spin up infrastructure and, and instances of your stuff just for, just for them. And that, you know, maybe they want to have their, their customer data separated from other customers um, who might be there, of yours, who might be their competitors, right? And so there's that kind of pressure. Okay, you have to have separate environments for us. 
Um, and then sometimes there's just co-branding stuff, right? So you're gonna kind of customize um, software for maybe you're doing like partnerships with somebody and so you're saying we're gonna deploy our software um, uh, with different branding and, and, and the, those kind of things. So those are some of the kind of scenarios I, 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 I tend to see where um, you know, we end up with lots of different production environments. And oftentimes this is not kind of planned, right? This is the, this is the thing because we kind of start out when we're designing this stuff, we say, we're not gonna do this, right? We're gonna have a single instance and we can do the kind of multi-tenancy thing and that's really the efficient way to do it. And then you get these kind of business pressures where it's like, well, we got this customer waving a bunch of money at us saying, you know, I, I, they refuse to be hosted next to you on the same, uh, you, know, um, you know, infrastructure as one of their, their competitors or what have you. And so you can't turn down that money and so you end up just kind of like hacking it together. And you end up back with this kind of snowflakes as code thing where it's like, um, you know, every country that you're in or every kind of customer that you have, you've kind of copied the, the code and tweak it and edit it. Um, and typically you kind of, what you see with these kind of things is when you get a new customer that comes in, it's like, oh, make sure you copy the code from the last customer we did because that's the one that we made the most fixes to. The ones before that, they're all kind of like manky and, and kind of stuff's wrong with it that we haven't got around to fixing, right? Um, not familiar to anybody? <laughs> um, and so I think the thing that we would like to be able to do is a bit more of a kind of composable environment. So it's like you think about, okay, there's common elements of the infrastructure that we need for all these different instances. We'd like to be able to configure those and maybe have, in, in some cases, we're gonna deploy some stuff and not others, depending on what it is that, that the particular customer or the region needs, whatever the differences are. Um, and so you kind of want to have your, your infrastructure code as, as something you can kind of like, you know, pick as components, right? Componentized, All right? Um, I'll talk a little bit more about kind of some compo uh, thinking about components in a moment. Um, so the, the, but where we're, we're trying to get away from is that monolithic thing, right? So when you have just all of your infrastructures in one big blob, one big project, that's where, uh, you know, it's really hard to, hard to kind of break it apart, hard to do those kind of dynamic things of having partial environments to test, say, one application or to subsets of the services that we want to offer to a particular customer. Um, and so the way that we kind of uh, deal with this, again, I'll have three things on here. So one is finding, out, finding ways to make those environments more composable. Um, then being able to use that to design the infrastructure and, and provision infrastructure around applications rather than, than kind of more kind of horizontal thinking of, of, of the architecture for it. Um, and then again, pr dynamically provisioning the infrastructure. So for, for composable infrastructure, what we're talking about is splitting that monolithic infrastructure. So as an example, this is like, let's say it's a big Terraform project, right? So I worked with um, a client a couple years ago in London where they had a Terraform project. When you ran Terraform Apply, it took two hours to run. Um, they had one file called rds.tf. It had 60 MySQL database instances in there. Um, yeah. And so like when we, you know, we were talking about with them was, well, how do, we, how do we break this down a bit, right? How do we make it so that we can have separate kind of, um, you know, bits of infrastructure separately provisionable for each, right? And so let me, let me go to the kind of component model to, 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 to think about how kind of, you know, how we originally thought about it, how they originally thought about it. So, the, um, when you think about just the runtime, like the infrastructure that actually runs, for the most part, the level of components that we talk about, like they don't really exist, right? Maybe we have tags and stuff that indicate, you know, what, what kind of things are where, but really you've got the, the applications and stuff that are running on it, that are deployed onto it, and then you've got those individual resources from the IAAS, infrastructure service level, kind of, you know, the API, what does it give you in terms of resources, right? And everything else is just kind of like, you know, imaginary. So you have your, your source code context is where, you know, in your, your Plume, your Terraform, or your whatever, um, your Ansible, you have like the things which, which correlate to the, the individual, what the API gives you, right? So it's very low level. This is, you know, um, mapping of, of what the plat cloud platform gives us and how we want to wire it together, right? There's examples of the kind of what those look like. And then you've got the, uh, and this is one of those things where the, the, the terminology is, is not consistent across vendors, right? But stack is kind of, um, you know, kind of ish, like we, I think we know what we're talking about when we talk about stack, which is basically the deployable unit of infrastructure code, right? It's like when you run your, your apply or, or, or whatever the command is, um, this is the unit of code that's gonna get applied and, and might potentially change, right? Um, and so stack, there's, it's a code level thing and it's a deployment level thing as well. 
Terraform project, CloudFormation stack, and so on. And I also want to touch on the, the libraries, right? So going back to that client with the two-hour Terraform apply, uh, when we talked about, oh, we need to break it up, you know, we need to kind of break that up into smaller pieces. They're like, oh, that's great. We'll make a bunch, turn it into a bunch of Terraform modules. And it's like, well, Terraform modules don't really um, cross over, right? They're not a deployment unit, right? They're a code organization unit. When you run Terraform apply, it's still going to read all those modules, pull them together, and then apply them. And it's still going to take at least two hours, maybe a little more because you have to kind of coordinate now. It has to kind of download the different modules and work out the versions and such. So those kind of libraries are useful for organizing your code and even sharing code across projects, but it doesn't help with that. Uh, you know, how do you kind of make the deployment level um, smaller and more composable? Um, so there are some examples of, of things that work at that level. Um, I feel like there is a, um, uh, a higher level to think about in terms of, of designing our infrastructure and, and, and a higher level component. Um, I like to think of it as an infrastructure product. I'm kind of like cribbing from uh, data mesh. We have data products and all that. It's like how do you define something which is kind of meaningful to the, the, the consumer of it? So the application, as an application team, what's meaningful to me? Um, if we're going to say we want to break down those, that deployment stack into smaller pieces, that becomes kind of a technical thing. So what's the right level of design for that infrastructure code uh, at, at, that, that makes sense in terms of how we want to deploy it and make changes to it? it might not be the same level that's meaningful for the application folks. In fact, it might be that um, that, that has like multiple stacks are actually involved in that. So maybe you have different stacks that are doing kind of the data um, and that, that needs to be treated a little bit differently because we have to worry about persistence of it versus some other parts of the infrastructure might be in a, in a stack that we can kind of destroy and recreate quite quickly because it's, you know, everything in there can be ephemeral. And so have, be, having the kind of freedom to kind of decouple that level can be useful. Um, so yeah, and I, there's a few things I've seen out there. So Plumi has the, the concept of projects, which is, is, is kind of at this level. Um, or can be, you have, the, have the, the idea of micro stacks where you break down smaller stacks within a project um, and can deploy them separately. Now, HashiCorp have confusingly announced they're coming out with this new thing that they call stacks, which is not what anybody else calls stacks. And it is basically how to configure multiple Terraform projects and modules, uh, you know, and, and, and integrate them. Like, okay, you can have a couple of projects where the inputs from some feed into the others. So that's conceptually, I think, fairly close to this, but. Um, yeah, it's kind of disappointing to me that they, <laughs> they overload that term. Oh, well. Um, yeah, and so the, the, the second pillar of kind of uh, making this stuff work is thinking around how, how can we design our infrastructure around the applications, around the requirements of the applications, right? Because I think the, the natural way that we tend to build infrastructure, especially when it's at that high level of, of across of our different workloads that we may have, is we kind of think of, of it technologically, right? We kind of think about, oh, you should have all your networking stuff in one project, if we're going to break it up, and then we'll have all the database stuff and compute. And this is like in software architecture, this is also a classic pattern or a classic anti-pattern, right? We kind of found that actually this causes problems because you, you get these kind of coupling across, like if I need to make a change to the, the, the infrastructure for just one of those applications, I'm touching things which might affect other applications and their infrastructure. So um, the kind of vertical layering is really, um, more effective as a way of, of, of dividing things up so that you can kind of work on the changes to each uh, independently. Um, and then keeping in mind that also, so one of the kind of, uh, I, th I think, useful divisions to think about is thinking about the infrastructure that is specific to the application. So maybe it's things like the load balancer rules and the, you know, the database instance and, um, you know, I don't know, message queues that are specific to that, you know, for that, that kind of service or what have you. Um, versus then there's the shared stuff where it's like, okay, maybe it's a container cluster that multiple applications in. So thinking about those divisions then helps us think a little bit about how do we organize um, and, and gets us into that. How, how, can, we, how can we have uh, infrastructure that's going to be provisioned specifically for that application because we've kind of identified that, right? Which is this, right? And so this is the idea that rather than seeing uh, our, an environment is something that you build. So you go and you build the environment and then it's there and then applications can go and deploy their stuff in there and, and try to get it to work in the environment. Um, can we do it application driven way, right? So can we say, okay, along the bottom there, there's some things that are shared and maybe, so maybe we have the concept of an environment and the, the stuff that is, that, that, that it is at that level. So you provision an environment 
um, and then the things get provisioned for that. Um, and then the things that are specific to my application, when I deploy my application, the infrastructure code gets kind of grabbed and, and, and either um, you know, provisioned and, and, or updated or what have you. Oops, that was going the wrong way again. All right. And so this is basically just the idea of getting us to that flexible cloud infrastructure, or my kind of thoughts on what, what maybe the, uh, um, you know, the DevOps report is, is, is talking about when they say what, what helps to make actually you get more, you know, better, higher performance out of using cloud. And so just to kind of summarize it up, that's about, you know, thinking about how we do the software delivery, number of environments we can support, and the number of different workloads we can have on it. See how we can make the, that infrastructure more composable, design the infrastructure around the applications and, and, and make it dynamic. So that's, uh, yeah, so that's my thoughts. I'm, I'm happy to hear kind of feedback and, and ideas on that. Thank you.